So we are going to do part three, and then we need to start part five today a little bit. Your, um, your lab this Thursday is on Le Chatelet's principle, which is part five. So it'll work out fine. I used part two. So we're doing part two now? Uh oh, used to part three. Oh. Yeah. Okay, unit three, sorry, thanks. Okay. We'll do part two. That must have, okay, then I got that all mixed up. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna do part two, skip part three, and go to part four, oh. which is the Charlie's principle. Oh, okay. So just follow the bouncing ball. We'll get through all the slides. But I thought, oh. just as a courtesy, I'd take a running start at this, um, just to kind of remind you how this works. In part one, we spent some time looking at how to write equilibrium constant expressions. So of course, this is an equilibrium with two reactants and two products. And we can write, I call it sometimes a KC expression. KC expression and equilibrium constant expression are the same thing. Basically, you mathematically have a constant that's for a specific temperature, okay, um, for this reaction now. In this case, we do use the stoichiometric coefficients as exponents, okay. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like, okay. Oh, now, I thought I should go ahead and warn you, um, that units three, bless you, unit three and unit four are actually related. And if you look ahead to unit four, unit four is we're going to talk about pHs and hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion concentration. And that is one big equilibrium. So it's not until finally we get through, fight through this battle, can we really intelligibly talk about something as simple as pH. And that's something that they talk about in introductory science. But actually, it's an equal chemical equilibrium. So um, then just, this is also a review slide. Um, remember we looked at this chemical equilibrium down at the bottom there. We have three different scenarios here. We said that um, we just, in each scenario, started, so these are, these are our initial amounts over here, initial concentrations, okay? We have three different initial concentrations. Let the dust settle, dust settle, and here, in the gray area, I really like these slides if you can't tell. Here in the gray region, there's where equilibrium has been established. And so when we write our KC expression, those are equilibrium concentrations. Okay. Mathematically, I just think it is so cool. I don't know if it's just me, but mathematically, those regions in the gray, all raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, will be the same KC value. I just think that's so cool. Okay. The reason they're different is because the starting amounts were different. We're going to be talking about that. Okay. They're different because if you look on the left there, we started with different amounts of reactants and products. The first one, we had no product, some reactant. Um, the next one, we had um, no reactants, just all product. The last one, we had reactants and products. And we let the dust settle. Just let them fight it out and come to the same KC. I just think that is so cool. Oh, no, it's just me. So now we're switching gears, and there's all sorts of, you know, part one was chucked full, stocked full of important things, okay? So, but now related to that, I'm skipping a lot of things in part one, we are mixing it up now. We're going to um, something called the reaction quotient. The reaction quotient. Now, you might be like, oh my gosh, the QC looks like the KC. And you would be right. It's calculated the exact same way. Reaction quotient is calculated the same way the KC in the equilibrium constant expression is calculated. The catch is, is that um, a reaction quotient is, a, is more of a, it's, I call it a snapshot of the concentrations of all the reactants and products at a given time. It may or may not be at equilibrium. Okay, so your QC is just any time. Your KC is at equilibrium. Okay, but you calculate them the same way. She looked like she had a question. Well, I'm, I didn't ask because I would probably get to it. So how would they be different? If, yeah. If they're um, let's see, did I put this? Where did it? Yeah. Okay, so this actually I inserted. So here, um, just to emphasize how they're different. These are the concentrations at equilibrium, okay? And these would give you, you know, KC. In fact, let's just go ahead and, let's go ahead and use this down here, 
okay? Um, Kc is equal to the molar concentration. It's always products over reactants. So the molar concentration of the alcohol, CH3OH, raised to its stoichiometric coefficient, which is 1, divided by the molar concentration of the reactant, CO, raised to its stoichiometric coefficient, 1, times the molar concentration of H2, raised to its stoichiometric coefficient, which is 2. Okay, that's in those areas. Now, it's kind of like a Venn diagram. I could calculate a reaction quotient for anything. I'm going to go ahead and include at equilibrium. I can take a QC, and I'm going to calculate it the exact same way. And I'm not going to repeat that because it's just... I calculate it the exact same way, but it's at any time. It can be before, at e before equilibrium, at equilibrium. And I'll show you where, how it's significant. You're like, why would you want to do that? Well, there's a reason. Reaction quotients. The significance of reaction quotients. Why would you want to take a snapshot? Well, basically, we find it helpful in you, you calculate your reaction quotient, your QC, and you compare it to your equilibrium constant, Kc. You compare Qc, which is any time, to Kc. And I was thinking about this. Um, let's see, how do I emphasize this? You guys know that K, okay, uh, equilibrium constant, Kc. We've also talked about Kp, where the it's not molar concentrations, but it's partial pressures, okay? We're going to kind of use those equilibrium constants interchangeably. Um, but those are, they're constant. Okay, they're in stone. Okay, this one will vary depending upon when you, um, depending upon are you at equilibrium or you're not at equilibrium. So I'm going to kind of show you, so obviously if they're not equal, you know, if QC is not equal to, you know, your constant, your equilibrium constant, then it's not at equilibrium. You're like, I'm good with that. But the other part is very important. There's almost, I want to say an art to it. It's an important thing. I'll show you how once you get your QC, you can compare it to your KC and know which way you need to proceed to get to equilibrium. I'll show you what the, that looks like. So, if they are equal, if you take your snapshot, your reaction quotient QC, and it equals your va the mathematical value of KC, then ding, you must be at equilibrium, okay? Well, let's just say you go ahead and you take your snapshot, your reaction quotient QC, and it's less than KC, okay? Well, then, the, what I usually do is I go back up to my expression, and I say, okay, if it's too small then I must need to go ahead and make more what's on the top. That's how I think of it. So what's on the top are the products. So if it's too small, okay, it's not at equilibrium, okay, and I need to make more of my products. Reactants must be converted to products. That's how I think of it. I don't like to memorize things. So if I was doing this on a test, even if it was relatively fresh in my mind, I just covered the, I would probably think through it. And I'm like, now what does that mean if your QC is too small? Well, you need to beef up what's in the top. Now we could say kind of something different about if your reaction quotient is too large. If your reaction quotient is larger than your equilibrium constant, K or KC, then um, if it's too large, you have too much products and you have to get rid of products. So that's why we say here, products need to be um, converted back into reactants to reach equilibrium. Because basically, um, yeah. yeah. So you take a snapshot with your reaction quotient, compare it to your, QC, your K, your QC to your K, and, and make these conclusions. Now you can memorize them or you can kind of think through them. Either way will work. All right, is this where we do an example? Okay, so let's do an example. You guys are gonna have some homework. Have some try at this. So hopefully right off the bat, you look at that um, and you think, well, that's an equilibrium. I can come up with an equilibrium constant expression. A Kc is equal to blah, 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 blah. 
okay? Using stoichiometric coefficients, it's always products over reactants. Stoichiometric coefficients as exponents. Um, notice that you have to, if you're like me, I have to read problems several times. It's saying that we have a little bit of everything. This is kind of like that third scenario. It's a different equilibrium, but that third scenario um, where we have a little bit of everything. So everything is at 0 0.0020 molar. Okay, so that's the initial concentration. And they give us a Kc, and remember it's a m moderately favoring products. Remember the larger the Kc, the more it favors products at equilibrium. So here are the questions. Is it at equilibrium? So we're going to take a snapshot, come up with our reaction quotient, and see if it's equal to 46. If it's not equal to 46, um, if it's, what do we say, if it's less than, we're going to have to go ahead and form more products. And if it's greater than, we're going to have to take products and convert them back to reactants. That's how I think of it. Okay, so here we go. We can write the, the, the reaction quotient expression looks exactly like the equilibrium constant expression, except it's a QC instead of a KC. I bet you buy that, molar concentration of HI raised to the second power divided by the molar concentration of H2 times the molar concentration of I2. And we know those are all 0 0.0020 molar, so we s plop those numbers in there. And the math looks pretty easy. I think I can even do this. Notice that basically all of our terms cancel and we're left with one. Okay, make sense? So our snapshot is 1, and our KC was 46. So in this case, our reaction quotient is too small, and so we need to make more of that HI. So that was the second part of the... The first part is, at the, are they at equilibrium? Is it equilibrium? No. Second part is which direction do you need to go? And the answer is to the products. So you're not going to find out the QC ever with just the um, balanced equation? Right. You can't come up with a snapshot unless you're given molar concentrations. Exactly. Yep, yep. So it's not at equilibrium. And since it's less than, but like I said, I just don't memorize things well. Since it's less than... I have too much, um, too much, uh, it's less than, did I say that wrong? I said that wrong, didn't I? Since it's less than, I did say that wrong. Since it's less than, you have too much in the top. I said that wrong just now. You have too much in the top, so you need to go back to the <laughs> reactants. No, it's less than. You don't have enough in the top. I did say it right the first time. Okay, good. I've come full circle. Since our snapshot, our reaction quotient is less than our equilibrium constant, it's not large enough yet. So we need to form more product. Okay, final answer. <laughs> I convinced myself. Okay. I know. I said it's a short one. So I'm like, I know I was running late, but I think we'll do fine as far as I want to get to in the topic of uh, La Chalet's principle. So let's take a look right quick at what these, there's three problems. And they look like this. So some of this stuff is pulling in what we talked about in general chemistry one. So you're always, well, there's kind of one exception coming up, but in general you're going to come up with molar concentrations. You know, if it's not partial pressures, it's molar concentrations. Um, so here they give moles of, um, they give you the balanced equilibrium. Um, we have two reactants and uh, one product. Then if you're like me, in a problem like this, it's easy to get my numbers mixed up, but they give you the moles of the two reactants and the two products. They give you the overall volume, so in a minute my hint says you basically have to divide those moles by the volume to get moles per liter to get the molarity. Okay, but it's very similar to what we did. Um, so your equilibrium constant expression looks the same thing as your reaction quotient um, uh, expression. But notice that I went ahead and I did this 
last year, these hints, but I put a little subscript E's there just to emphasize that an equilibrium constant expression are molar concentrations at equilibrium. It's not a snapshot, it is at equilibrium, okay? And they give the value as 100. And then we talked in this part, the whole idea of a reaction quotient is it looks mathematically the same, but it can be taken, it can be the situation outside of equilibrium. So um, I put my little zeros there for kind of the initial, because I bet it's not going to be that equilibrium. It's either going to have to go form products or go back to form reactants. Um, and then my little hint was to, like I said, you have to take those moles that are in the box and divide them by the volume to get molarity. And then um, once you have molarity, plug into your, your reaction quotient expression and then compare that to 100. Okay. So if it's not equal, then they're not, it's not at equilibrium, which I bet is the case. And notice this one doesn't say, um, doesn't say which direction will it go, but it just says explain. So to me, if you did this, you would, you would have succeeded in saying that they are not equal and it's not at equilibrium. Okay. Um, this one's similar. Um, yep, very similar. Notice that this one um, favors the reactants because it's small small QCs. And then this one, oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. You got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. This one does, does say, um, it will it, which direction does it need to proceed to reach equilibrium? Those are my hints there. Okay, so this one's a little, uh, little, little different, a little trickier. If you read it a few times, get your cup of coffee and all that, basically what they say is they have, um, they have the two reactants and the two products in that same box in equal gram amounts, in equal gram amounts, which is kind of strange, I know. And what we need is molar concentrations. So if you read my hints, and I don't want to belabor it too much, but we can get to moles by taking the mass, which is the same for everything, okay, um, and divided it by, wait a second. This is the molar mass of these compounds, molar mass of these compounds. X is the molar mass of these compounds. Um, the mass is the same in all cases, and we can get to the moles by taking the mass, which is the same, times the version of the molar mass, okay, which is what this is here, okay. So this X will vary for each compound. But the M is the same for each compound. Do they make up for argument? Well, I'm going to show you that the way it shakes out, because actually you have the same number of moles of reactants and products, is they all cancel. So if you just leave them as variables, I'm going to show you. If you leave them as variables, you can basically just use the molar masses as their molar concentrations, just because of how it works. Um, molarity then would be. Um, the moles divided by the volume, and I told you how you get the moles, is the mass, which is common, um, times the flip version of the molar mass of everything, okay? And of course, then there's your reaction quotient expression. Um, and the deal is, is if you go ahead for each of these compounds and plug in the molar concentrations as this kind of weird quantity, okay, you're gonna see that, like I said, because there's two terms and two terms, your uh, your volumes are going to cancel and your masses are going to cancel. So, that, if that helps. That's, so, it gets the molar mass. so it ends up being the molar mass. But in looking at this, I'm pretty sure it would be kind of the inverse of the molar mass because it's, the grams are on the bottom. So, if you get the other two, this one, one like this will not be on the test. The test will be more like straightforward like the other two. <laughs> But, yeah. And then um, the, it's the same deal. Once you get QC, they, give you, they gave you K, and you see if it's at equilibrium, which, of course, it won't be because that's the topic, and then say which direction it, it needs to go. So just do your best with that one. The other two are pretty straightforward. Okay. So now on to... Dun, dun, dun. Something we kind of already talked about. 
Chalet's principal, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's how I pronounce it, Chalet's principal. Um, if it seems familiar, it probably, um, it's because when we talk about solubility, we talk about the Chatelet's principle. And we said if, um, if the process was endothermic, then um, adding heat favored more to go in solution. If it's exothermic, then actually adding heat disfavored it and made it more come out as solution. Um, so that's, if it seems familiar, that's why. So Chatelet's principle, Chatelet's principle talks about systems that are in equilibrium. So of course we have equilibrium reactants going to form products and products going back to form reactants. That's a chemical equilibrium. So basically you know it's in equilibrium if your arrows are the same size. I wish I hadn't made those so big. Um, <laughs> but let's just say you go ahead and monkey with you know, you, you, you screw around with the reactants. Let's just say you add more reactants or pull more reactants out, okay? It's going to have, um, whether you add it or pull it out, well, actually, I just say if you add it, if you add it, actually, temporarily, you're going to be forming more reactants and less products if you increase it, okay? This is add R. I'll talk about how that works. But here, if we remove R, Remove R, then actually, as you might intuitively say, you're like, oh my gosh, if I take away some of my reactants, okay, I bet it's not going to go from reactants to products as much, and that's actually going to be more heavy on the product to reactant side. So that's that's one way to stress a system. And we talked about adding heat to um, to um, solvent and solute. Okay, so wait, how do you stress an equilibrium? So just a minute ago, I said, well, you can add a reactant, or you can take a reactant out, or you can add a product, or you take a product out. You can monkey with the temperature. Something's going to give. Um, we're going to look later about if, you, if your reactants and products are in their gas phase, if you um, monkey with the pressure, like by changing the volume of the container they're reacting in, then you're going to change your chemical equilibrium. Um, okay. So let's just today talk about um, what if you sprinkle, what if it's at equilibrium? See, that's what I'm hoping you get. It's at equilibrium and you, um, okay, and you monkey with it. So now kind of left to right over here on the right, this is at equilibrium, okay? You, the molar concentration of your products raised to their stoichiometric coefficient divided by the reactants raised their stoichiometric coefficients is Kc. Um, the reaction quotient snaps out at any time. Okay, so let's just say, um, like I said a minute ago, what if it's at equilibrium mining its own business and you sprinkle some more A in it? And you're going to keep the other reactant B the same, and you're going to keep the products C and D, you're not going to mess with them. By golly, if that's the case, you know that basically, I don't know if you want to think about it mathematically, but you're going to increase that, okay, and it's in the denominator, so you're going to, what, decrease, does that make sense? Your QC will go down. Cool. And then if you want to kind of follow the logic that we talked about before, then that would, um, what do we say? If it goes down, you don't have enough. Yeah. <laughs> if it goes down, it's too small. Then you have too much. You don't have enough product, right? Yeah. See what I mean? So you need to make more products to get back to your new equilibrium. That's it. That's totally it. Okay, so it, to me, what I think works pretty good with Le Chatelier's principle, and I mentioned this with kind of when we talked about solubility and temperature, is that 
it's like a tug of war between the two sides. And if you add more of this, basically you're kind of pushing it that way. Okay. And it works pretty, it, the same thing mathematically, however you look at it, um, is the case. So in this case, when the dust settles, like this says, you're going to end, if you add more of this, it's going to favor the formation of the products and more of the products C and D. So actually, your new equilibrium is going to have more C and more D. Okay, and not so surprising, maybe it's going to have less B. B is going to draw the short straw because mathematically it has to end up to be the same constant. Once you kicked it out, you have to kick it back in. All right. Okay, so we could look at it a different way. What about instead of adding A, what if we subtract A? And if you think of the tug of war thing, if you subtract A, you're kind of, instead of pushing, you're kind of pulling. So if you subtract A, honestly, the way it works out is that um, you need to form, you need to take your products and go back and form more reactants. And however you want to get there. Notice that if you if you take more if you take more um, if you take A away, okay, then you're taking away the denominator. So actually, your QC is going to be bigger, and it's going to be bigger than your K. And what do we say about that? We said that you need to convert some products back to reactants. So. Again, however you want to think of it. I think of it as a pull. When you're removing, you're pulling it. So in that scenario, if you are, if you take some A away and it you need to take your reactants, excuse me, you need to take your products and go back to form reactants, then when the dust finally settles at your new equilibrium concentrations, you'll have less C and D, okay? You'll have more B and less A. But again, um, once you establish your new equilibrium, mathematically, you have to have the same KC. So I just, and I kind of go back a little bit to those three scenarios of that equilibrium we talked about before break. You know, the, you know, start with different amounts. What sort of equilibrium concentrations will you have? might be about it. So kind of be able to kind of think through these. Um, if instead of a reactant, if you focus on a product, um, and again, we can look at it mathematically or just think of the tug of war. Um, if we increase um, a product, to me, that's like pushing. <laughs> okay. If you increase a product, you increase these. This is going to be larger. You're going to have to go back. To reach your new equilibrium, you're going to have to go that way. Your arrow that way is going to be larger than your arrow this way for a little bit until you get new amounts. And if you take the product away, um, it's like pulling. And so you need to, you'll end up with a smaller KC to, so I've been putting it on there. You'll end up with a, um, a smaller reaction quotient than your KC, and then you need to go back. So that's as far as I wanted to get. I kind of want to switch it up just a little bit. Um, when we come in Wednesday, we're going to finish this part, whatever this part is, and then we're going to go back to the part right before it, which is all sorts of little math thingies. Okay? And as far as I know, um, I'm available for a session after class on Wednesday.